Welcome to the workshop, Out of the Frying Pan, Life After Transplant Using Donor Cells. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. It's my pleasure to introduce you today to our speaker, Dr. Scott Rowley. Dr. Rowley is a professor of medicine and the director of the Stem Cell Transplant and Cellular Immunotherapy Program at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. He is also the medical director of the Cellular Therapies Manufacturing Facilities at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. Dr. Rowley's research has focused on developing bone marrow graft processing and cryopreservation techniques. He served on the committee that wrote the standards for cell processing adopted by the Foundation for Accreditation of Cellular Therapy. He has also served on boards of the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy and the International Society of Hematotherapy and Graft Engineering. Please join me today in welcoming Dr. Rowley. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, very kind introduction. And I also want to thank the BMT Infonet, um, Susan Stewart in particular, and her colleagues for the, uh, for the opportunity to present um, to this group. My presentation today is an overview of late effects for, after allogeneic transplantation. And I gave a bit of a cute title to talk about out of the frying pan because you know, we talk about various phases of transplantation, the initial hospital stay. I tell patients after they're discharged from the hospital, usually 12, 14, 18 days when they achieve engraftment, that now the work really starts. Um, because over the next several months, there are many complications of transplantation that can arise, including infections as well as graft-versus-host disease and various complications. A third to half of people will be, be admitted to the hospital for some complication of allogeneic transplantation. But usually this settles down about three months after transplantation. People can return home um, if they're being transplanted at a distant uh, facility or um, make the visits less often to the transplant program if they have a local transplant program as well. So my presentation today um, will be an overview. It's an overview of survivorship. And um, basically, cancer survivorship is no longer a rare event. And we're here focused on allogeneic transplantation and the treatment of cancer, um, but there is a considerable amount of survivorship uh, research efforts, support, going across um, not just the United States, but also European countries and other countries as well. And from the moment of diagnosis and for the balance of life, a person with cancer is a survivor. And there are quite a few, num quite a few people um, who are survivors. I'll show that in the subsequent slide. But today, what I want to do is address the late effect after allogeneic transplant. And at the conclusion of this presentation, um, I really like you to have an understanding of the long-term health risks after transplantation, particularly uh, several primary health issues such as second cancers, heart disease, um, and um, chronic graft-versus-host disease and complications like that. We want you to be able to establish a proper long-term care plan with your physician, whether that be a transplant physician or you're returning back to your primary care physicians um, that have cared for you over the years. And we also want to address, the time permitting, the care for your caregiver. Now, as I mentioned, cancer survivorship is no longer a rare event. These are data from um, the United States, and there's an estimated 18 million cancer survivors in the United States in 2022. The right-hand slide shows that these are primarily people over the age of 65 because these cancers that we have are primarily diseases of the older person. So colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, leukemia, myeloma, the diseases we transplant for, these are typically cancers of patients over 40 years of age. And you can see the orange segment of the graph there is people over the age of 40 to 65, and the blue is the patients over the age of 65. So we're dealing with lots and lots of people across the United States who are cancer survivors, not just the transplant patients, but um, also patients with other forms of cancers and other treatments. And we've seen this older age population um, in the United States in transplantation as well. But let me just talk about the fact that we are seeing improved survival over time. I first became involved with transplantation at Johns Hopkins in 1981. 
So I've been involved in this field for about 40 years. And on the right-hand slide, looking at the adult population, and, um, and just uh, aside here, I will be focusing primarily on adults. I'm an uh, internist, not a pediatrician. Um, so on the right-hand slide, age of uh, patients who underwent transplantation over the age of 18 years, and you can see um, in the, the dark blue, 2001 to 2005, there was about a 30 to 40 percent probability of being alive at five years after allogeneic transplantation. And if you look at five-year intervals, you can see that the survivorship rate continues to improve over time. And I would suspect that we're going to be over 60 percent um, with current data um, as transplant medicine continues to get better. So we're seeing improved survival after allogeneic transplant as we get better at um, our treatments, our supportive care, um, taking care of complications of transplantation. This is going to uh, directly result in more cancer survivors and also more cancer caregivers. I do not want to forget about our caregivers as we go through this presentation today. I mentioned that um, this improving survival is despite the fact we're treating older patients. In 1981, I sat with a woman who was 40 years of age and said, you're kind of old for a transplant. And um, her response back to me was that she would rather see her daughters get married than graduate from high school, so we went forward with the transplant. But what's happened over these decades that I've been involved is that we're able to deliver transplant medicine to older and older populations. And on the right-hand curve, you can see that we're about 20, 25 percent, maybe approaching 30 percent of patients who undergo allogeneic transplantation are over the age of 65 now. And this is important because um, myeloma, leukemia, lymphomas are typically diseases of people who are over 60 years of age. And if you can't deliver transplant medicine to these people, then you are not treating a large population of people who might benefit from such treatment. So there's been a real focus on being able to deliver uh, transplant medicine to people of older ages. But we also have to look at the fact that older patients are more likely to have comorbid health issues, such as uh, high blood pressure, um, hyperlipidemia or cholesterol and triglycerides. They may be more likely to have diabetes. They may be more likely to, be ha to have obesity or be obese. Um, so that the transplant teams have to be able to deal with a person who has other comorbid issues that we did not face when we were treating patients back in the 1980s. And this is shown here, the examples of the health issues that we are facing. Um, Pre-diagnosis, our you know, a variety of different health issues. I just listed some of the common ones, high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, uh, high blood sugars, obesity, I mentioned these. Um, we also have to deal with the cancer-related complications. Bone damage, for example, is extremely common in patients with multiple myeloma. It's oftentimes how they present, a uh, bone fracture, low back pain that just doesn't go away. And when they're evaluated, they find that they've had bone uh, collapses or bone fractures. And we can have to deal with malnutrition. Even if somebody comes to transplantation with normal weight, they may actually be malnourished with loss of muscle mass. Um, there can be organ damage as a result of the, the disease that they have or the treatments that they received to try to get the remission. And then um, health issues that we face after transplantation, there are the treatment-related issues, such as heart disease, second cancer, ovarian failure, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the... the factors that pre-existing health issues that you see on the left-hand side of the curve may be exacerbated by transplantation. And as we sit with patients getting them ready for transplantation, we're looking at their uh, comorbid health history, whether they have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, whatever, and try to develop a regimen that we can bring them successfully through transplantation without a lot of treatment-related illnesses. Now, just to get a little bit on the uh, morbid side here, let's talk about death after allogeneic transplantation. Um, I've sat with many a young physician and said, okay, what is the primary problem with allogeneic transplantation? I'll say graft versus host disease, and I'll say wrong. It's relapse. Um, relapse is the primary cause of death after uh, transplantation, but it's much less likely to occur once or two years or more after transplantation. Um, the statistics I've heard is that 50% of all the relapses that are likely to occur will occur in the first year, and 50% of the next group of relapses will occur in the second year, so you're up to 
and then it just becomes less and less common that you will see relapses after two or three or more years after transplantation. Um, transplant programs are facing this. We're actively exploring consolidation or maintenance regimens after the transplant to reduce the risk of tra uh, relapse. Um, chronic graft versus host disease is also a problem with increased in ongoing infection risk and organ damage, uh, both as a result of the suppression of the immune system, the recovery of the immune system, as well as the drugs that we use to treat chronic GVHD. And the current holy grail for transplant medicine is that we want our people to have both freedom of chronic GVHD and also a very low risk of relapse. And so a lot of the research that's going on in allergy and transplantation now is looking for GRFS, GVHD and relapse-free survival. Now, again, um, these are a slide from the CIBMTR. Um, I don't know if people in this audience know, but all transplant programs in the United States are required by law to submit data to a central database for every allogeneic transplantation. And these data can be used to uh, conduct research about questions of allogeneic transplantation. Um, and you can see in the lower right-hand corner that for patients who died after day 100, so still very early on transplant, relapse is the primary cause. That's the dark blue portion. Um, it's a bit of a beige color is the GVHD, that'd be chronic GVHD at that point, and above that is infection, 14%. Um, those two go together. So you can see again that GVHD and relapse are the primary health issues or long-term health issues that we would see with after transplantation. And there'll be people who'll be talking about that as part of this consortium. But um, there are a variety of possible health issues after transplantation. And again, I mentioned cardiovascular disease, second cancers. Um, there can be damage to lungs, liver, kidneys. There can be bone and joint damage, um, particularly with corticosteroid use, prednisone use, oral health. People oftentimes have dry mouths after transplantation, leading to loss of teeth if they don't have proper um, dental health care. Um, there can be infections, there can be ocular complications, skin problems. So a variety of complications um, can occur after the treatment of cancer, not just transplantation. Um, other possible health issues that we see are well known after allergenic transplantation, but also after other uh, uh, treatments cancer treatment in general. There can be depression, anxiety, altered body image, is very important. There can be uh, changes in interpersonal relationships. How does a cancer survivor deal with friends and family members who have not had the experience of having cancer? And redeveloping the interpersonal relationships that, that might have been changed by the fact that they are cancer survivors. There can be uh, impacts on health and life insurance. Um, you're very unlikely as a cancer survivor to be able to get a new life insurance policy. You may find that you have job lock, you can't get promotions, or you might have loss of job. There'll be financial burdens. So there are a variety of issues that are raised in cancer survivors. Now I want to um, redu uh, introduce a couple concepts. One is relative risk, and one is cumulative incidence. So relative risk is what's the likelihood that um, a, you will have a complication as a transplant survival compared to a healthy individual. So this is a slide from many years ago, um, published 20 years ago, and it looks at pediatric patients who are survivors of cancer treatment, not transplant, but cancer treatments. And their control group was a sibling, um, a brother or sister. So you're dealing with um, a patient and a controlled population that have the same parents, grew up in the same house, grew up in the same neighborhood, have the same schooling, have the same financial um, um, resources. And if you look, for example, at the leukemia line, the second line down, you can see that the cancer patients would say that they were twice as likely, 2.2x, twice as likely of having problems with general health, 3.8 times as likely of having functional impairment. Um, 1.8 times as likely to have limitations in activity, and 1.7 times as likely to have problems with mental health. Now, this sounds bad, um, you know, that you're twice as likely to have a complication um, of something compared to your sibling. But a lot of these events are rare events. So twice as likely of 1% is now 2%, which means that you're 98% likely not to have it. 
And so that's one of the things when you start looking at relative risk um, is that you have to look at your controlled population and say how likely it's to be occurring there. So um, here's percentages. So if you look at the leukemia, yes, 9.6% of the uh, survivors of leukemia treatment said that their general health was impaired. 9.3 um, said they had functional impairment. Um, 8.6 had activity limitation, and 17.5% had mental health limitations. But again, if you look at the flip side of it, the glass half full side of it, that means that 90% of these patients are doing quite well after their treatment when they became adults. So this is uh, looking at the percentage of patients who, re who develop limitations in their health versus their relative risk. Relative risks are twice as likely, but they're still small numbers. And we will see that throughout the um, data on the transplant here. Now, one of the things that we're facing as we get more and more sophisticated is trying to develop treatment plans for individual patients. And the individual patients may have special needs. Um, this is just a uh, slide that's showing the racial proportions of patients undergoing allogeneic transplantation. And overwhelmingly, this is the Caucasian population. Um, but we do have uh, racial and ethnic minorities that come through our treatment. But even in the Caucasian population, there are differences. There's what we call the social determinants of health. And these include the economic stability of the patient and their family. Um, do they have access to education and quality? Um, what's their access to health care and what's the quality of health care? You know, are you living three hours away from a city and, and your you know, level three trauma centers and, and um, medical care centers, or are you living in a city where it's just a taxi ride across town? What about your neighborhood environment? Um, are you living in an environment that has uh, good water, good air? And certainly the social community context, you know, what's your supportive care available to you? And, and so we as transplant physicians, as we bring people to transplant and then send them back to their community, is we want to look at the whole needs of our patient, not just whether we took care of their leukemia. Now, I showed this slide earlier. I, I put asterisks on this. And actually, I think depression was on the lower right that I didn't put an asterisk on. I think it's being addressed also. But these are all health issues that are going to be specifically addressed um, through the six-day, seven-day, seven-day consortium. So, for example, um, Dr. Harn will be talking about graft-versus-host disease this afternoon. And Dr. Loren will talk about secondary cancers. Um, we have a question and answer session tomorrow that's going to be talking about allogeneic transplantation. Um, Thursday, we can talk about maintenance therapy, exercise, nutrition. So a lot of these subjects um, will be talked throughout this symposium. So I can't do any one of these justice in a limited time frame here. But you will have other speakers who can present specific issues that you may be interested in. Now, let me go back to life expectancy. Um, this is a slide of a study from um, a couple of years ago, 2021. And they looked at a 40-year, actually, population um, transplanted between 1974, which is when I graduated from high school, and um, up to 2014. And they looked at patients who were alive two years after transplantation. And they compared this to life table data from the Centers for Disease Control from the US government. So they tried to find out what was the life expectancy for a person of the same sex and age um, and see how they compared in terms of their life expectancy. And what their findings were is that over time, there has been a change in the patient populations undergoing transplantation. I mentioned back in the 1980s, transplanting somebody over the age of 40 was pretty rare. Um, it was pretty much a pediatric and young adult population with which we dealt. And now we're treating people in their 60s and 70s. Um, there have been changes in the uh, regimens that we use for transplantation, a variety of uh, regimens. We have our maxis, our minis, our midis. Um, we have changes in donor types. We can use unrelated donor transplants, mismatched family members, haplo donor transplants. And the diseases have changed also. The chronic myelogenous leukemia used to be the number one reason why I came to work. And, and now we have uh, medications, oral medications, that control that disease quite nicely. And we rarely see that particular disease. So there have been changes over time um, that transplant medicine has been studied and made available to people in the United States. But what they did find was there is an 8.8-fold increase overall mortality. So that if you take anybody at a similar age, that um, what's the likelihood that they will die 
um, is about 8.8 .8 times that. It's highest at two to five years after transplant. The relative risk is 34-fold. Um, but even 30 years after transplant, and again, these are people who are transplanted at a very young age, um, it's still a 5.4-fold increase in mortality. And what they found also that there was a decrease in life expectancy with about 8.7 years of life loss. So that means that if you're if you're genetically going to live 90 years, that you will live 83 years. Um, and you know, so that there are long-term effects of cancer treatment and possibly allogeneic transplantation. When they looked at the causes of death, they said relapse-related mortality was 12%. Again, these are people um, that were um, late after transplantation, but they did see other causes of death, which we will address today, and that's infections, second cancer, and heart disease, which uh, were about um, what, 5 to 10% of the causes of death. Now, let me go over those specific um, issues then. So health issues after transplantation, infectious diseases, late fatal infections. Um, this is an analysis from the CIBMCR database again, 10,000 adults, 5,000 pediatric patients, and they found that the infections were cause of death of 31% and 29% of all deaths. But the probability of having an infectious death by 12 years after transplantation was 6% and 2% for the adults and the children. And the risk factors for these were older age, mismatched or unrelated donors because of the wound to the immune system that comes from using uh, mismatched donors, and chronic graft versus host disease, again, because of the effect on the immune recovery, immune system recovery after transplant and the medications that we use. And um, But the good news is that many of these infections are vaccine or antibiotic preventable illnesses. The bad news, and this is an issue that I face with many people, I get this question about um, can I go on my bucket list, uh, take the trip up the Amazon River, for example? And my answer to that is we have no way of knowing how robust your immune system is. And so that any um, travel, for example, outside of an area where you have good water supplies, I would be very concerned about um, because I can't say to a person in my clinic that I know what their immune system can be like. You know, so there's always the risk of infections, and we want to manage those risks. What about second cancers? And again, I'm going to give you the incident ratio. Um, this doesn't mean you're 7% you know, likely to get it. It just means that compared to a healthy control, um, any skin cancers will be seven times more likely. We see a lot of those within the first year or two after transplantation, particularly squamous cell cancers, basal cell cancers. There's something about the immune system um, that when it is suppressed that these cancers can arise. And we see this not just in transplantation. We also see it in treatment of, for example, autoimmune diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, anytime you suppress the immune system, you can see some skin cancers arise. And fortunately, um, you detect them, you remove them, and you cure them. But other cancers, thyroid cancer, mouth cancers can be seen with uh, persistent GVHD or radiation therapy. Lung cancer really is tobacco use. And you can see we're starting to see publications which say that the incidence of lung cancer is actually below the control group, you know, 0.7% uh, likely. Um, you know, um, um, and that's because we select patients, preferably, who do not have bad lungs coming to transplantation as a result of tobacco use. But breast cancer can, um, um, can be seen after transplantation, particularly in women who have had radiation therapy to the chest. Um, or younger age. Um, we can see cancer of the cervix. Um, a risk factor there is graft versus host disease. The colon cancer may or may not be increased. I have a mistake in the slide there. It's not five. It's 0.5 incidence ratio um, to 2.2%. Um, but no specific risk factors reported and no specific risk factors uh, for prostate cancer, another common cancer in men after, um, as we age. I won't say after transplantation, but as we age. What about heart disease? Um, again, looking at the middle column relative risk, um, um, a person who's had an allogeneic transplant is 2.7 times as likely to have a death from heart disease compared to a healthy control, um, is 1.4 times as likely to develop um, coronary artery disease and angina, uh, 1.3 is likely to have a stroke. 
but these risks go much higher if there are risk factors for heart disease and stroke. And they're listed as the fourth bullet on the lower left-hand side of the slide here. Risk factors are high blood pressure, high lipid levels, cholesterol and triglycerides, diabetes, and renal disease. And if you go to the far right uh, slide, you can see that the relative risk then really zooms if you have three of those risk factors. You have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, then your risk of stroke is, is very high. Your risk of a death from cardiovascular disease is 25 times the control group that doesn't have those issues. And what we see is that um, after transplantation, what is the likelihood of seeing high cholesterol and high blood pressure and so forth? And there's this illness called metabolic syndrome. And it's a combination of high blood sugars, high blood pressure, high lipid levels, cholesterol, triglycerides, and abdominal fat. And this is called metabolic syndrome. And this is more common after transplantation um, than uh, patients who did not receive such treatment. And the metabolic syndrome, as we showed on the previous slide, is associated with heart disease and all, well, actually with all-cause death. I mentioned um, obesity um, as a risk factor here. Um, waist circumference, abdominal fat is more informative than bone marrow um, index, your BMI. And so I mentioned earlier in the slide that people can come to transplantation with loss of muscle. They're actually uh, malnourished with loss of muscle mass, but this can be seen even with normal weight, something we call sarcopenic obesity, where you lose your muscle mass. You, your, your muscles in your legs, your arms, your core muscles have been lost as a result of treatment or malnourishment, malnutrition as you go through treatment, but you can still come to transplantation with normal weight. And what that is, is you have an increase in body fat. So you actually come to transplantation malnourished. And so after transplantation, there is a 2.3-fold increase in cholesterol levels or more risk to have a high blood cholesterol or, or blood triglycerides. You're two times likely to have high blood pressure. Um, these things come with aging as well. I have to say that when I hit 70, I finally had to start my um, Lipitor for my high cholesterol levels and some other medications for my prostate, but um, they come with aging. But we also see that they're increased with allogeneic transplantation. And if you don't manage these risks, um, you can get an increased relative risk of coronary artery disease. So that instead of being twice as likely to have heart disease, you're 12 times as likely, or as on the previous slide, even 25 to 30 times as likely to have heart disease. So I'm laying out the groundwork of what we have to deal with after transplantation. I'll come to some slides as to how to manage these things. So health issues after transplantation, neurocognitive disorders. You know, I've had a lot of people complain about intention and concentration, particularly during the first three months after transplantation. Um, and the domains that we talk about, attention, perceptual processing, learning, abstract thinking, motor function, emotions. Um, and on the other side of the slide, up to 58% of adult patients report that they will have neurocognitive disorders. Um, these data are limited for older patients, people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. We don't know what's happening there yet. Um, studies need to be done. The good news is most patients do recover to baseline in most of the domains, although many people will say they still have some mild symptoms at five years after transplant. I put some interventions in there. Um, primarily try to avoid medications, um, but um, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions with things like weight loss, exercise, good sleep hygiene, um, um, non-pharmaceutical no, sorry, non-pharmacological interventions to help improve the quality of life. So how do we um, prevent some of these things? So one thing is proper vaccination. And so that these are, this grid is well known among the transplant field. I know that there's been political concerns in our country about vaccines, and some people believe strongly in vaccines, some people don't, but this is our uh, recommendation. And then you can see that starting at three months after transplant, we give a particular pneumonia vaccine called Prevnar 13. And we repeat that at six months, repeat it at 12 months. And then um, two years later, we uh, give a different vaccination for pneumonia. We, for people who are younger, the human papillomavirus, this, we want to give this to both men and women because it not only prevents cervical cancer, but can also prevent um, mouth cancer and throat cancer that we're seeing with oral sex. 
hepatitis B vaccines, the polio vaccines, the tetanus diphtheria vaccines, hemophilus, meningococcal vaccines, whole series of com uh, vaccines. For people who are older and have had chicken pox, we give the recombinant shingles vaccine. Um, if you do not, if you've not had chicken pox and um, our younger patients, then we have to go with a live virus vaccine, the Verivax first. But the live virus vaccines um, aren't given until at least two years after transplant and a person is no longer being treated for graft versus host disease. Influenza vaccine, we recommend it every year. I've been getting my influenza vaccine every year for the past, I'm gonna say 40 years. Um, I have no problems with it. Um, I'm not addressing COVID vaccines. We, that's still shifting. Find out what, we don't know what the answer is gonna be there. What about cancer screening? Um, this is not specific to transplant. This is uh, um, from the American Cancer Society. And, um, and they say, okay, we should be starting our colonoscopies or similar treatment for colon cancer at age 45. It used to be 50, but we're seeing colon cancer in younger people. Lung cancer is no specific screening unless you are a smoker, in which case we would recommend low dose uh, CT scans of the chest. Breast cancer, um, Talk with your PCP if you've had uh, radiation to the chest. Um, talk with your doctor. Talk with your oncologist. Um, but starting at uh, 45 years of age, you can see the annual mammograms. And the recommendations for cervical cancer and, and prostate cancer as well. Heart issues. Um, there are a variety of tools to assess 10-year risk. When I started on my cholesterol medication, my internist, um, and did some magic on the internet and said, okay, your risk of developing heart disease over the next 10 years is X. I don't remember the number. But um, so there are a variety of tools to assess your risk. But um, you want to look at your dietary patterns and change your food, your diet away from foods that might increase the risk of heart disease. Um, obesity, I mentioned, uh, it does go back to BMI, but it really has to do with your abdominal girth is where the field of medicine is right now. Physical activity, um, um, I'm able to go to the YMCA and lift weights in a weight class twice a week. I have that opportunity, and um, that'll help you know, reduce my risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, watching for diabetes, watching your cholesterol, watching your blood pressure, avoiding tobacco use. I put in here that no tobacco, no tobacco use has ever been shown to be beneficial to health. Um, what about transitioning to general medical care? Um, is your transplant center your primary care team, or do you have the benefit of a long-term clinic at your center, or are you going back to your primary care physician? And there are issues such as the distance from the transplant center, convenience, the medical expertise. During the first three months after transplantation, I do not want an internist um, taking care of patients because of the drug-drug interactions that if a medication were to be started with, I am not aware of there the other medications that I would need to adjust. And so we try to provide all aspects of medical care during the first several months. But once people are um, free of many of the complications of allogeneic transplantation, uh, we do offer the opportunity to go back to your local physician. You know, it may be more convenient, um, parking might be easier, um, might be easier to get an appointment, um, but, but um, you know, that's a personal decision as to each individual patient. But how well are we doing here? How many people in this audience have visited their primary care physician over the past year? And these are data from the University of Ottawa where there's less of an issue about health insurance and keeping people from visiting their, their physicians. And what they found was that uh, pre-transplant, only about 17% of patients had visited a primary care physician. By five years after transplantation, only about a third, 36% of people had visited their primary care physician. And what this translates into is a horrible um, result in terms of screening, screening for the complications of uh, transplantation. Um, you know, look at your cholesterol. 25% of people had a screening for cholesterol testing. 20% had diabetes screening, 30% had breast cancer screening. So that um, I think that we as the medical care team and, and uh, the cancer survivors also have to be aware that there is the need to address the long-term survivorship. So for example, questions here, how often should you have a return visit? What follow-up tests, if any, should I have? How often will I need these tests? 
What symptoms should I watch for? If I develop any of these symptoms, whom should I call? And the, this, again, is not a transplant. This is uh, uh, from um, the Journal of Clinical Oncology that says the failing to plan is planning to fail. And how do we improve the quality of care for survivorships? And patients should have written, ideally, a follow-up plan. But even a non-written follow-up plan is there's a good understanding, like we call the recovery from acute toxicities, um, what recommended cancer screening and other periodic testing should be done, what are the possible late and long-term effects of treatment, what are the impacts on your insurance, employment, financial consequences, what kind of ongoing health maintenance should I, uh, program should I be involved in, should I be receiving maintenance therapy? That'll be addressed by your primary, your, your primary oncologist, not your primary care physician, but you know, should you be on maintenance therapy to reduce the risk of relapse? And um, you should be provided a list of cancer-related resources and information. I have uh, three slides at the end of my talk here that list uh, just a short number of resources that you have. So let me switch quickly um, for the next uh, couple of minutes just to the caregiver. What do we know about the caregiver before and after transplantation? Now, this is an extremely important issue because I will not take somebody to transplantation if they do not have a caregiver. I need to see that caregiver eye to eye. I need to be able to speak with that caregiver. I need to be able to know that the caregiver who is going to be a member of my team and caring for the patient is able, is capable of doing this care. But what we do know about the caregivers is there's a fair amount of anxiety and depression. Or these are present before transplantation, and they may actually be higher in the caregiver than they are in the patient. Um, anxiety, 46, 47% of caregivers report anxiety and depression, 16%. And these have to do with your social support. Are you, um, do you have, does the caregiver have support? Or are they um, remotely located to a distant transplant program? How good are they at self-efficacy and coping? What's the caregiver uh, burden? How much care are they required to give? What's the financial stability of the, of the house? And what do we know about the caregivers? We now can recognize system clusters. These things go together. Um, these clusters can occur as a group, fatigue, sleep disturbance, depression, anxiety, cognitive difficulty, you know, so-called chemo brain, you actually see in the caregivers as well. And it's probably a result of fatigue, sleep disturbance, poor nutrition, lack of exercise. We find that caregivers who are lonely have greater symptoms, and people who are much more self-efficient will have lesser symptoms or fewer symptoms. Um, we can intervene. Um, there are two intervention models. Uh, these are uh, given the one on the left, BMT care was during the first 60 days after transplant, the one on the right given uh, through the first 100 days after transplantation and doing cognitive behavioral strategies, uh, psychological counseling and so forth. And um, they find that the, they improve the caregiving burden, the results of anxiety and depression, improve coping skills. And as a, as a physician, when I see caregivers, again, I look for that there is a good caregiver, but we also want to make sure that we have a caregiver team, that we're assessing our caregivers, that we have a, a good education system, that we're screening the caregivers for their needs um, as they go through the transplant course, because they are team members. And just as um, I expect that the nurses and the doctors go home at night to get their sleep, I expect the caregivers to take care of themselves as well. Long term, though, there is a lot of long-term caregiver issues as well. And um, see it more in the women caregivers and the male partners. Um, partners and patients reported worse sleep and sexual problems in control populations. They have worse fatigue. They, again, both the caregivers and the patient reported more cognitive dys dysfunction, the so-called chemo brain. They had worse impairments in mental health and depressive symptoms. But the, the caregivers, not the patients require, uh, reported they had lower social support, higher loneliness, and less satisfaction in their partnership and control. So these are issues that need to be addressed. I'm going to quickly sum up here. Um, there are a number of caregiver issues. We're all going to probably be caregivers. My mother took care of my father during his pancreatic cancer. I have a brother taking care of my mother now. She's 94 years of age. Uh, for my um, in-laws, uh, we were able to afford a caregiver in their house um, because they lived in another part of the country. But there are a number of caregiver support programs out there. And just to give you these couple of slides here, you can look them up afterwards. But the caregivers have the right and they actually have the duty to take care of themselves.
and to seek help as they need it to make sure they can continue to function as caregiver. I need to um, sum up here. So I want to sum up here with this. Long-term health consequences of cancer and treatment are real. Um, they're a minority of the patients, not a majority, but they are real. It is possible to establish a proper care plan to offset the risk of heart disease, infection, second cancers, and your caregiver also requires long-term support in recovering from the difficulty of going through a transplant and taking care of somebody that has cancer. Thank you, Dr. Raleigh, for this excellent presentation. We will now begin the Q&A session. If you haven't already asked a question down in the chat box, you can on the lower left side of the screen. And we'll take as many questions as possible today. Okay, the first question is, tell us about why and when and how a person's blood can change from their O to the donor's B after transplant. So allogeneic transplantation is organ transplantation. The bone marrow is an organ. It's an organ that you can't easily hold in your hands the way you can hold a um, heart or a lung or a kidney. Um, this organ is in, uh, makes your blood. So your blood is being made in the bone marrow. And stem cell transplantation, um, you are actually receiving the hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cells from the donor. So when these donor cells engraft, you are basically an identical twin with your donor uh, in the bone marrow. The rest of you know. And we've had all sorts of comments made about, am I going to be like my, do my donor? Am I going to have his personality or quirks or whatever? Um, but the, the answer is that, no, your bone marrow will be the same as the donor. And the bone marrow makes the, the different cell lines, you know, the white cells, red cells, and platelets. And so you will make the red cells of the donor. This starts very early on after transplantation, you know, 7 to 12, 14 days later when we see engraftment. If we were to do a bone marrow at that point, we would see red cells being made as well, and they're going to be a donor of red cells. So if your donor is a B and you are an O, um, your O cells will die off as your bone marrow dies off, and the B cells will come up as the donor cells take over. Now, there are nuances here. Um, you give a B cell graft to somebody who has um, oat blood, um, are you going to see a transfusion reaction? And that's a possibility. We have ways of managing that, and it's not really a, an issue. Um, to, that occurs during the first hour or so after the transplant, the actual infusion of cells. Um, people who have a different blood type may take more red cell transfusions over time um, because the O person, their antibodies, because they will have anti-B, um, will mow down the B red cells for a period of time. And so if somebody who's a different blood type will take more red cell transfusions, but that wears off over time. And I expect by 30, 40 days after transplantation, even those who have a different blood group will have donor red cells growing and become transfusion independent. So it all has to do with the fact that the uh, donor cells are going to grow up in there and you'll be making red cells, white cells, and platelets that are equivalent to the donor, to the, uh, donor itself. Okay. The second question is from a patient who's 18 months out of their allogeneic transplant and they've suddenly started gaining a lot of weight and their blood glucose levels are high, but they were very well controlled before the tra transplant. Does this eventually even out? with the help from an endocrinologist? Yes, it should even out. And it's going to require, though, an incredible amount of work because I think it's going to require um, not just management of medications, but also lifestyle changes as well. And, um, you know, so there will have to be exercise as well as dietary changes as well as medication changes. But, you know, especially if you are receiving certain medications, corticosteroids, for example, which just wreak havoc with the, the ability to control blood sugar. But there are other medications such as cyclosporin that may have effects on blood glucose control as well. And then as you um, heal up from the transplant and are able to be um, be weaned or tapered from these medications, that'll take a lot of the stress off. But um, again, that metabolic syndrome that we see is more common after allergen egg transplant is something that needs to be addressed. You have to work with your internist, your primary care physician, 
um, the nutritionists and just focus on trying to get back to a good, healthy body weight. Okay, this is a two-part question. Do you need to be completely off immune suppressants before vaccines are administered? And then if you're having trouble getting off immune suppressants after two years, what do you recommend? That's a two-part answer as well. So there are a number of vaccines, or most of the vaccines on that grid are not live virus vaccines. And so they can be given to a person without risk of inducing an infection. So for example, if we give the Verivax, the live um, chickenpox vaccine to somebody who has a suppressed immune system, they can and oftentimes will develop chickenpox because they can't fight the virus, they can't control the virus. And, um, but on the other hand, the Prevnar 13, the Pneumovax vaccines, the tetanus vaccines, um, the influenza vaccine, um, these are not live virus vaccines. And, um, and so you cannot get illness from these vaccines. And we talk about, you know, people talk, uh, they got the flu vaccine, you know, and they gave them the flu. Uh, impossible. But a few years ago, I had the flu vaccine and I felt absolutely miserable. I said, now I know what people talk about. But it's the reaction to the flu vaccine, it's not the flu itself. And the next year I got my flu vaccine, and every year subsequent to that, I've had my flu vaccine without that reaction. So you can give the non-live virus vaccines to people who are early after transplant, three months, six months. Um, you can give them to people who are on immunosuppression. But the other half of your question is, uh, what about the live virus vaccine? So the MMR vaccine, and um, for our younger patients who never had chickenpox and cannot get shingles vaccine, the uh, Shingrix vaccine, um, you want to give them the Verivax. Then we have a 218 rule. You want to be two years after transplantation and one year after being free of immunosuppression and at least eight months after IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin. So that's a fairly common you know, so-called 218 rule because um, if you give the live virus vaccines to somebody who's on immunosuppression or early after transplantation, you run the risk that you're going to give them the disease. And um, fortunately for a lot of these diseases, um, herd immunity comes to play. Now there are populations in our country, various neighborhoods, different populations that do not believe in vaccinations. And we see outbreaks of things such as chicken pox or measles. And, um, but for most of us, we're protected by the herd immunity. Most of the uh, people in your community have received vaccinations, and so it's very unlikely to see a very big outbreak of measles or chickenpox across your community. So you're protected by that. But no, we do not want to give these live virus vaccines um, early on after transplantation or while a person has immunotherapy. Okay, here's another vaccination, vaccination question. Does Gardasil vaccination help after you've had after you have human papillomavirus, and how often should you have PAP once you're diagnosed with HB, HPV? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, should we be vaccinating um, our older people? And that's a question. I think some transplant programs are giving the HPV or the Gardasil vaccine um, to their older population um, with the idea that maybe the immune system will benefit from this, and certainly, um, there are many different uh, varieties of this virus. Um, it's not just one virus. There are different families. Just There are different families in COVID and different families in influenza. Um, and that maybe, in theory at least, that the Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, will help prevent some of the other um, viruses from taking hold. But I have not seen an answer to that question directly. I've only seen the hypothesis that maybe these people who've had HPV will benefit from this. I don't think the answer is there. And I think that for the general population as a whole, they would recommend against it. Okay, thank you. How can I help my kidneys recover from high creatine over one year post-transplant? Um, there is no real way of helping the kidneys recover other than avoiding the insults. Um, so um, the insults, you know, one of the easy insults is dehydration. You, know, you do not want to be dehydrated. And we want to make sure that you're well hydrated. Another common insult are medications, so that there are various medications that are very damaging to kidneys. And your primary care physician or any of your physicians should be aware of your creatinine 
when they sit at their desk and write a prescription out for you so that um, so that it's being addressed. Even your pharmacist, um, you can you know, put into your file that you have an elevated creatinine, that your creatinine clearance, your kidney function is depressed, depressed, and they will um, be able to put in your file and notify the physicians if there's a, a drug interaction or a concern about kidney function. But unfortunately, um, once kidneys have been damaged, they do not have recovery function. Okay, this person had an aloe transplant 11 years ago and just recently were, was diagnosed with non-alcohol related cirrhotic liver. What, if anything, can I tell my doctor to help in my treatment? Yeah, that doesn't have anything as far as I know of being related to the transplant other than the metabolic syndrome. You know, the, the go back to the metabolic syndrome of abdominal obesity, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, et cetera. And um, so I don't know of any specific directions to the physicians caring for this person um, who has the, um, the, the, the liver problems. Um, I think that you just address it um, as you would the liver problem, not you know, specific to transplant, but just to anybody with this. Okay. Do you know of any maintenance therapies that are currently used to reduce the relapse rate during the first two years post BMP? We are learning a lot in this area. Um, you know, the, with the genetic testing that's now being done, um, you know, AML is not AML is not AML. Um, we have FLT3 positive AMLs. We have NPM1 positive AMLs. We have IDH2 mutations. We're learning that cancers are very distinct from person to person. So once we learn that, now we start looking at can you target the uh, cancer cell in some way. So a FLT3 positive AML, um, there are certain drugs that specifically target that um, mutation. And so um, we would give somebody with a FLT3 positive or mutated AML, serafinib, or um, one of the other drugs that targets the, you know, the FLT3, but we wouldn't give them a drug that would target IDH2 because that drug would not be effective, and vice versa. So it really depends upon the disease you have and how much do we know about that particular disease. Now, there are mutations that occur that we do not know how to target them yet, but we, you can be certain that the scientists are working on that. Or the pharmaceutical companies can sell a lot of drugs if they have a, a, a treatment that can target a particular mutation for any of the diseases. Okay, can you please explain what happens when chimericism falls, fails? when it fails? Okay. Well, there are a couple of different forms of chimerism. What I focus primarily on, the lymphoid chimerism. The real reason we do a transplantation, allogeneic transplant, is actually to put a new immune system in there. Um, the stem cells are there to help recover the person from the high-dose chemotherapy we might give. But the treatment of cancer um, is really just putting a new immune system in there. And so I'm looking specifically at the immune system of the donor um, what we call CD3 chimerisms. And um, there's also CD34 chimerism, which is the stem cell. And that's more a measure of a relapse versus non-relapse. You know, who's in there? You know, who's making the blood, the donor or the recipient? But the lymphoid chimerism is what we're looking for to give us our graft versus tumor effect. It can vary. I've seen somebody go all the way down to 0% and then claw his way back up to 50%. Um, there is no uniform answer to that. Um, some doctors will reduce their immunosuppression and hopefully the donor cells will take over. And um, other doctors will increase the immunosuppression hoping that the donor cells are less likely to be rejected by the recipient. Um, but, um, but it is something that should be looked at because my experience is that a good robust donor immune system predicts for a lower risk of relapse after transplantation in both myeloid and lymphoid malignancies. Is there any effort being made to update the standardized information that's given to patients regarding the treatment, symptoms, et cetera, of chronic GDHD? I don't know of any standard information. You will find this, um, for example, the speakers giving talks about graft versus host disease as part of the symposia. But I don't know of anybody who, um, any publications are saying this is the proper treatment. 
Chronic graft-versus host disease is a multi-organ disease. In fact, eyes, mouth, lungs, um, kidneys, skin, um, et cetera. And um, not everybody has the same presentation. Um, it's an important that um, when people go back to primary care physicians, I still ask people to come back to see me intermittently because um, there may be skin changes. It could be a second skin cancer or that might be a GVHD that might not be recognized by a primary care physician that I would recognize immediately as a complication of transplantation. So, um, but there is no standard way of uh, treating them. We're trying to avoid corticosteroids. So a lot of the treatments now that we're using um, for chronic GVHD, roxolitinib, and belamozadil, um, these are what we call, quote, steroid sparing, end quote, agents because steroids uh, create so much uh, havoc. Okay, have you seen neuropathy as a long-term complication from transplant, not just for multiple myeloma only, was not attributed um, to chemotherapy? I've seen some with um, tacrolimus. Um, I had a surgeon who was having a very difficult time standing at the operating room table, and we finally attributed that to tacrolimus and got him reduced, you know, weaned off of that medication, and his neuropathy got better. But, um, but um, the let's see, I'm, you know, other medications can cause neuropathies. Um, I'm not certain there's any chronic graft versus host disease of the nervous system. Um, but I would think that there could be a lot of this related to medications that are being used. A, a good, uh, it's a very difficult area. I mean, we have people with chronic neuropathies, you know, such as who've had um, medications uh, for myeloma that uh, you know, can be very debilitated by the neuropathies, and we don't have a good answer for that or good treatments for them. How long do platelets take to? Oh, Oops, go ahead. Uh, I, um, I, I think I stopped my slides a little bit early. Um, I want to mention to people, I'm just going to pop forward with a few slides here. Um, selected resources, do know that um, these are in your slide set, that um, these are just a partial listing. Bone marrow transplant, Inflamet has a wealth of information on transplantation. Caregiver support is another slide here. And then um, legal and financial support. I just want to make sure you understand that these slides are available for you. Um, but go ahead with the last uh, question. Okay, yes, the last question is, um, how long do platelets take to recover after transplant? Um, that's variable. Um, they're usually slower than white cells. White cells come back first, platelets second, and uh, red cells third. Um, um, we have people that may be transfusion, platelet transfusion dependent for several weeks after transplantation, but I expect that most people will have platelet recovery by um, four weeks, five weeks after transplantation. Um, if they remain platelet transfusion dependent, then we have to look and see if there is a graft problem. So that entails getting a bone marrow sample. And if, there, if we have good growth of the bone marrow, then they're being destroyed. And, and they're being destroyed in the peripheral blood, um, something called ITP, idiopathic thrombosis, uh, cytopenia purpura. And, um, and so we have ways of treating that. Great. On behalf of BNT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Riley for a very helpful presentation and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BNT InfoNet if we can help you in any way and enjoy the rest of the symposium.